this week's teaching is going to be related to uh, ocular care in intensive care and we're going to have a general club presentation it's an article comparing different eye ointments uh, for use in intensive care followed by a teaching session on acute eye care in icu so the journal club will be presented by dr jamin arya who is a anesthetic trainee over to you jamin Hi, yeah, so my name is Jamin. I'm one of the uh, trainees at Glenfield currently. Um, so the, the article is meant to complement the teaching. And also, I think there was an eye care audit that's ongoing or has been completed. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been presented today or not. Um, but the article is uh, basically this. Um, it was based in Iran, um, which compares three different treatments, uh, simple eye ointment, polyethylene cover and eyelid taping in prevention of ocular surface disorders. We all are pretty meticulous about eye care within theatres, um, but sometimes in critical care, um, this isn't the case. So this was just a, a sort of a comparison article um, to figure out if there's any benefits um, to each each treatment in an ITU setting. Um, so as we all know, uh, your protective factors when you're either sedated or unconscious on a ventilator or impaired. So things like your corneal reflex, your blinking, tear production, and sometimes your eyes don't close totally. Um, and in, especially in theatre and critical care patients, there's increased risk of ocular complications. There have been previous studies that suggested that it's quite a high proportion of critically ill patients um, that uh, suffer with ocular disorders. Um, I think personally, I've seen this more ever since COVID with the um, increase in number of patients we're proning. Um, it's quite interesting to see different uh, care uh, modalities that we can use for eyes and to try and prevent any complications. Um, however, there's no clear evidence or benefit over one or the other. Um, so this was just a single centre study to try and look at that. Um, so it was a double blind study. Um, it was in a trauma ICU uh, within this hospital in Iran. Um, there was certain inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, the inclusion criteria was they had to be over 18, impaired blink reflex. And for this particular study, um, they had to have stable hemodynamics, so no vasopressor or inotropic need in the patient. Exclusion criteria was either they had trauma which involved facial injury, had a history of eye disease um, and previous ICU admission within the past month. Every patient that um, got admitted or potentially um, entered into the study um, had to have a, a test uh, which was negative fluorescent test before they were allowed to enter into the study. Um, so this is a bit busy slide um, which was in the paper but I'll go through it. Um, so they found that over an 11th month period um, there was 181 patients and the interesting thing that they did in this study was uh, each patient has got two eyes and they did a different treatment from one eye compared to the other. So that allowed them to double the um, uh, number of patients or number of cases that they had. And they used different treatment in the same patient. So there was one group which had one eye with polyethylene cover and one eye with eyelid taping. Another group which had polyethylene cover and simple eye ointment. Uh, uh, hello? Did someone say something? Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, and it found out that there were about 136 uh, eyes which were able to be tested, uh, not 106 patients, and that was doubled um, to allow the number of eyes to be tested and therefore uh, had about 252, I think, 262 um, uh, cases uh, in this study. Um, so every single patient received a normal routine eye care, which included rinsing the eyelid, the skin around the eyes uh, every six hours. And then depending on the group that they were in, uh, it changed which depending on the eye. Um, sorry, the phone keeps ringing in the background. Um, so one, uh, one patient uh, had, uh, sorry. Uh, so if they were uh, randomized to the simple eye ointment, uh, they received the white paraffin, which was used every six hours. Um, the other one with polyethylene cover had to be changed every six hours. And even taping, they had to be changed every six hours as well. 
In all methods, the eyelid closure was checked every two hours to ensure that the eyes hadn't opened or if position had changed, the eyes hadn't changed position in that period of time as well. So I, I wasn't sure what polyethylene cover was, so I had to Google. Um, so this taping on the left-hand side is not what we use in ITU, but it was just a uh, visual representation. But on the right-hand side, the polyethylene cover is what they used in this study um, to try and uh, maintain eye closure and also uh, eye moisture as well. Um, so the eyes were examined daily for seven days to look for ocular surface disease and also its severity was graded. This was done by an ophthalmologist who was blinded to the study, so they weren't sure what treatment the patient was having. And they did a portable slit lamp and eye surface staining every single day for seven days. Um, if the eye test was positive, um, then that showed that they had suffered, um, suffered an ocular surface uh, a disease or disorder. Um, and then some patients also didn't uh, last the seven days. So this was either if they were extubated, they were woken up, if they had reversed of their blink reflex, or if they were transferred from ITU or discharged. And three patients unfortunately passed away, so were excluded from the, from the trial. So in terms of demographics, um, in terms of the age, there was no significant uh, difference within the ages between the three different groups. Uh, GCS is your uh, Glasgow Coma score. There was no significant difference within that and also in your sex uh, between male and uh, uh, female within each group. However, there was a significant, dif a significant increase of male patients compared to female patients. Not sure on the significance of that in terms of the uh, outcome of the results. So again, this is a bit of a busy slide um, uh, just to go through the results. Um, so each day, as I said, uh, they were graded and examined um, and then uh, from zero to three, which I'll go into the next stage, uh, next slide. Um, and it looked at how many patients in each group um, suffered from eye problems. As you can see within the tape group, um, a significant more uh, patients uh, suffered with eye disorders compared to ointment and cover. Um, and this was found within stati statistical um, analysis as well. Um, so this was the grading of severity of ocular surface disorder um, as per the ophthalmologist in that centre. Um, so it's grade zero, which is no, no problems uh, going on to grade six, um, which is microbial keratitis. Um, and if they suffered any of these and they went on to um, have appropriate treatment by the ophthalmologists um, during the ITU stay. So just going closer um, at the values, um, so as you can see, ointment versus tape and cover versus tape had a p-value less than 0 0.001, which showed there was significance uh, between, the, between the treatments. So uh, tape had a worse outcome in terms of protecting the eyes compared to the other two. Um, in terms of comparing uh, polyethylene cover compared to the ointment, there was no uh, significant difference between the two. Uh, and the other thing that this study didn't look at if there was a combination of treatments, which is something that I suggested uh, could potentially um, improve outcomes in the future. Um, so going through the strengths and the weaknesses, uh, the strengths of the trial, it's a randomised control trial where the ophthalmologist was blinded to what uh, treatment the patient was having. Um, I thought it was quite clever using different each eye for a different treatment, which uh, potentially minimised patient variability. And it was, the data was collected over a prolonged period of time, about 11 months. Um, and it did show there was a statistical significance between tape compared to the other two. There's a, quite a lot of weaknesses I found within this study. One is a single centre study um, and in a trauma centre. Um, so it didn't look at other um, ICU settings, for example, a neuro ITU or cardiovascular ITU. Um, small study groups, even though it was only over 11 months, it only um, had about 132 patients. Um, and the other thing I found was there was a lack of information of underlying pathology. So there's a lot of risk factors, as we know, to eye problems such as proning, if the patient's septic, if the patient's got uh, associated pneumonia or um, other uh, facial uh, problems. Um, and they didn't really tell us about the underlying pathology, um, which could influence uh, some of the results. Um, as I said earlier, is there a mixture of measures that are better? So, for example, combining your ointment and your tape or your ointment and your um, polyethylene cover. Um, and the other thing they didn't state was the route of admission to ICU. 
for example, an elective postdoc patient um, would have uh, adequate eye care during theatre. Um, so you'd expect them to have less eye problems during their stay compared to an emergency trauma patient who potentially um, could have suffered um, some sort of problems on transfer to uh, hospital or from transfer from A&E a a &E up, to, up to ICU as well. Um, so just going on about a bit, bit of background, um, as we know, so the things they didn't include in the study, so risk factors for the eye problems, uh, one of these is metabolic derangements, um, immunosuppression is the other one, so were they giving steroids or were they on immunosuppression beforehand, um, mechanical ventilation obviously they were looking at in this situation. Um, and one thing that I wasn't aware of was respiratory pathogens. So from open suction technique, this can increase your risk of ocular surface disorders as well. And we're all aware of prone positioning uh, over the past couple of years as well. So thinking about this study in terms of my medical practice, um, I think it's important to continue eye care from theatre setting into ITU and maybe this is this can be looked at, I think, as I mentioned, someone's doing an audit on that. So it'll be useful to see what the outcomes of the, that was. Um, and also identify a risk patient. So I'll go into the next slide, but there's a, a useful um, document from Australia, which they take a adequate eye history for every patient that's coming into the ITU setting. And obviously early ophthalmology involvement, if in any doubt. Um, so this is what the Australia uh, document suggested, which is the references on the last slide. Um, so eye assessment should be part of any routine uh, clerking of a patient on admission. Uh, so this includes if they're on any medication such as lubricants or eye drops, if they've had any previous eye problems, um, and also to try and risk stratify if they've got any risk factors for ocular surface disorders. So if they're immunosuppressive as mentioned, or if they're metabolically deranged, so for example, background of diabetes or background of their vascular path as well. Um, and also examining the eyes, which we all should be doing as well. Um, and then uh, making sure that even on our daily ward round that it potentially is part of a flat, a flat hug uh, to look at eye care as well, just to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, so I thought that's quite a useful way that we could potentially change, or me personally, to change treatment uh, or change my uh, management of a patient coming onto ITU, because it's something that I don't do um, thoroughly or well enough in my, in my personal practice. Um, so as I said, these are the references, uh, the last one's the actual reference for the article, and the other two are the Australian article that I found online, um, looking at uh, their eye care in that, in that centre. Um, is there any questions at all? Thank you, Jenny, for that, uh, for that presentation. I mean, we all do forget sort of eye care in the mix of everything else that happens with the critically unwell patients. But I think that's that's as important as anything else. We're just sort of looking at a document from the Intensive Care Society, uh, which is shows um, uh, about eye care in, in ICU setting. Um, looks like quite a useful document that one from the Royal College of Ophthalmologists as well, mm. along with the ICS. No. Thank you for presenting this. So, OK, again, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mo. I'm one of the ophthalmic registrars at LRI, and I'm just going to be talking about um, acute eye care and intensive care unit this afternoon. Um, it was very, I was actually listening in, at, in the journal club and quite a few things that I'm going to say. Jamie already sort of touched on it, so we'll just go over a few things as we go along. Okay, next slide, please. OK, so um, the reason why we're having this conversation is because a number of patients who are in ICU are quite um, vulnerable to developing ocular surface disease, um, which can be quite acute and quite painful and sometimes can be a bit scary. So it's just good for us to understand um, what is going on and what this could mean and what we need to do. Um, so a study that was done by Mestika et al. showed that about 42 percent of ICU patients would develop some problem with the um, external surface of their eye in the first week of admission. And this could be due to various um, number of reasons, which we'll touch on a bit later on. And a more recent study um, that was done quoted this incidence to be somewhere around 23 to 60% of patients, which is quite high. 
Um, most of the problems that occur in ICU, I mean, um, um, often ophthalmically are ocular surface problems. But sometimes patients can develop intraocular disease or even neuro-ophthalmology disease, which would mean that we need to call the ophthalmologist as soon as possible to um, see them. Now, if we understand the anatomy of the eye um, and eye diseases and how uh, a stay in the ICU can affect the eye, it will help us to identify um, eye problems in a timely fashion and also to implement treatment where it is needed to help to prevent patients from developing severe eye disease. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, just to touch about um, um, the anatomy of the eye. So the eye is made up of three different layers. We might remember this from um, medical school. And the layers are divided into the outer wall, which is made up of the um, cornea and sclera. Um, the cornea being the transparent parts of the eye and the sclera being the whitish um, bit that you can see um, outside of the cornea. Um, the middle layer is made up of um, the choroid and the uvea, which supply the eye with all the blood vessels. And the inner layer is made up of the retina, which helps us to perceive light. Um, the conjunctiva itself is not a part of the layers of the eye, but it um, lies over the sclera, which is the um, solid white part that we can see. And it's quite important that we um, recognize the problems that can um, occur in the conjunctiva. So we'll talk about that today. Okay, next slide, please. OK, so this just um, tells us a little bit more about the eye, again, showing the external surface on the um, left side of this um, slide. And the right side shows the different um, parts of the um, eye, including the vascular network and the retina. Um, in the ICU, you may not be necessarily concerned with the inner part of the eye, but sometimes um, in cases where a patient develops intraocular infection, it's quite important to understand how this can present and what layers of the eye is being affected. Next slide, please. OK, so um, what we aim to do when a patient comes into ICU is to protect the eye, to prevent disease, um, to identify any pathology when it develops and to be able to give treatment when we have um, prescribed it. Um, I heard Jamie saying earlier on, and I was also going to mention this, that um, eye care is a part of um, everything that we're doing in ICU. So when a patient comes in and we're assessing them for different parts of, uh, of different systems, the eye itself is a system that should be thoroughly assessed um, before um, once, once a patient comes in for admission. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so um, when a patient comes into ICU, because uh, I was actually working in ICU this time last year during COVID, and I've seen the um, ICU chart and I see that there's a small box there that talks about the eye um, and how we should be assessing it. Ideally, when a patient comes in, you want to see assess the eye within six hours. I say six hours, but it actually should be as soon as possible. But at the very least, it should be done within six hours of, of admission. And um, depending on the status of the patient, if they are conscious or unconscious, we determine if you are able to ask them questions about their eyes as you ask them about other systems, or if you need to refer to old notes or um, 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 electronic notes on, on ICE or on DIC3, if you have access to that. Um, if the patient is conscious, um, we should be asking them if they've had any eye problems in the past. Um, we should ask them if they wear glasses for reading or for distance. And this is quite important because um, you don't, a patient who is staying on ICU for a prolonged period of time uh, sometimes will then come up and say, oh, my vision is blurred. But if they haven't got their glasses with them, then you expect that their vision will be blurred. If you don't have that information beforehand, you may get into a panic that, oh, what's going on with the patient's eyes? Whereas if you already have that information beforehand, then you can say, OK, have you got your glasses? Have you tried wearing your glasses? Does this make any difference before making a decision whether there's a new problem or if this is an acute thing? Um, if the patient is unconscious and unable to answer you, then you want to check on ice or ophthalmic lessons, or if they have any relatives that we're speaking to about the patient's condition, we could also find out from them if they're aware that this patient has any eye problems. Um, you also want to do a bedside vision assessment. And I'm not sure if you have access to a Snellings chart in, in ICU, but at the very least, we could do something we call counting fingers where you stay up about three meters from the patient and just put your fingers up and ask them if they can see your fingers. And this could be a benchmark for which you use to assess the patient in the future 
if they require any visual assessment. And again, if, if you're not sure, you can check on ICE to see if there's any documentation of what the patient's vision was beforehand. Um, it's very important to check the patient's pupillary reactions, especially patients in ICU who might have neurological problems going on. So you want to know, is, is the pupil reacting normally? And, um, and I know that this is always documented in the, in the ICU chart. So um, if it's not um, um, responding the way you expect it to, then you want to start thinking if the patient has a neurological problem, or it could just be that the patient has um, problems with the pupils long standing, which you may be able to find in their notes if they've been to the ophthalmology clinic before. And if you're able to just crudely ask the patient to move their eye around, you also you can do that just to check that the um, nerves, which nerve, um, cranial nerve three, four, and six are working fine. And if they're not, then you're a bit more worried and you want to contact the ophthalmologist at that point. Um, the pen touch is um, something which is very useful, which I found very scarce when I was in ICU uh, for whatever reason. But it's actually um, very useful because it can um, tell you a lot about what's going on on the surface of the eye, which is what you're concerned about when the patient is in ICU. And I just put a picture of this pen touch, which has a blue filter, and it's quite cheap and easily accessible. And the reason being that um, when a patient has a problem with the ocular surface, this blue light um, in conjunction with the fluorescein dye can tell you if there's um, any scratch on the surface of the eye, which is causing the patient uh, any discomfort. So it's quite important for us to have a pen touch for each patient. Um, and if we can get a blue light, that would be very helpful as well. OK, next slide, please. OK, so I'm just going to touch a bit on, about the anatomy of um, two important structures that are relevant to the, um, um, the eye and ICU patients. Um, the first one being the conjunctiva. So I'm just going to go from the front to the back. Um, the conjunctiva is a loose transparent connective tissue that covers the surface of the eyeball and lines the inner surface of the eyelid. Usually you're not able to see the conjunctiva. You know, you're not aware that it's there if there's no disease process going on. Um, it, it's very important because it helps to contribute to the tear formation um, of, 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 of the tear film of the eye. And if there's any problem with this, it means that the, tear, the, the quality of tears is affected and that could invariably lead to ocular surface disease. Um, again, an important thing is that it is, it's filled with a lot of blood vessels and um, these blood vessels are very tiny and they're very thin which means that they are very susceptible to trauma um, and means that the patient can easily bleed from, from, from these blood vessels. And also they've got a dense um, lymphatic network which drains to the preauricular and submandibular nodes. And it's quite important for us to know about these lymph nodes because if you're thinking a patient has conjunctivitis, um, some of the time, not all the time, those lymph nodes in the preauricular area and submandibular area would be inflamed as well. So if you see a patient and you're wondering, does this patient has, have conjunctivitis, it's always good to feel for those nodes and see if there's any enlargement, which can help you to further um, say, yes, this patient has conjunctivitis or no, this patient doesn't have conjunctivitis. But bear in mind that it is not always the case that these lymph nodes are swollen. And also it helps in protection of the ocular surface and mediating active and passive immunity. OK, next slide, please. OK, um, the next important structure is the cornea, which is the clear um, part of the eye that we all see. And it serves a very important function in protecting the inner surface of the eye. And it's also responsible for 60% of the refractive um, surface of the rest of the eye. So you can imagine that if there's anything wrong with the cornea, the patient is not going to be able to see and um, the patient might be complaining of significant pain in the eye because um, also the cornea is densely innervated and it's probably um, one of the most innervated structures in the body. So if there's anything wrong with it, if there's any disturbance of the surface of the cornea, the patient will be in a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort. And um, its function is severely affected by the amount of tears that a patient is able to produce. It's affected by the amount of blinking that a patient has, and it's affected by the, the ability or inability of a patient to close their eyes. The cornea itself is avascular and derives its nutrition from the tears on the anterior surface. So if you start to see blood vessels on the cornea, then you know that there's a problem and you should contact the ophthalmologist at this point. Um, and disturbance in the normal physiologic composition of tears um, would significantly impact on the integrity of the cornea. Okay, next slide. 
Okay. So what are some of those risk factors that could affect the surface of the eye in, in the ICU? Um, um, things like a reduced conscious level of a patient, a patient who has facial edema from whatever reason, such as maybe generalized body edema or reduced for, um, venous return, patients who have peripheral or neurological injury, um, patients who have been treated with mechanical ventilation or oxygen face mask, uh, patients who have um, been prescribed or are, are being given muscle relaxants. Um, this significantly reduces the tone of the orbicularis muscle, which is responsible for eyelid closure and um, also the effects of positive ventilating pressure. So there are quite a number of things that um, are in the ICU environment that predisposes the patients to having um, ocular surface um, disease problems. And, and being aware of this and makes us uh, look out for this problem, um, for ocular surface problems in these patients. Next slide. OK, um, and there, there are some main problems that patients in ICU have when it comes to their eyes. There are other things as well, but the main things affect the conjunctiva or the cornea. And some of these things include conjunctival chemosis, um, subconjunctival hemorrhage, corneal abrasions, exposure keratopathy, which just means that the cornea is exposed and is drying out. Um, microbial conjunctivitis or keratitis, again, this means uh, bacterial infection in the conjunctiva or the cornea. And other rare things that could occur include endophthalmitis or neuroophthalmological um, problems, which affect the movement of the eye or um, affect the pupils of the, of the eye. Next slide. So when we talk about chemosis, we simply mean that there is ballooning or edema of the conjunctiva. Like I said earlier on, you're not supposed to know that the conjunctiva is there. So when you start seeing it um, blowing up like the first um, picture uh, um, on this slide, then you know that um, there is a problem. And um, some of the risk factors um, that could lead to this include or especially uh, patients who are prone, especially in this last two years where we've had to be turning patients um, due to COVID, um, we find that a lot of patients could develop chemosis as a result of this. Um, other things include generalized fluid overload in the patient's body, increased capillary um, leak or compromised venous um, return. Um, all of these things can lead to the conjunctiva swelling up. And they, it's important to know about this because it can reduce lead closure in a patient and sometimes reduced lead closure itself can predispose to having um, conjunctival um, chemosis. Um, uh, sometimes we get calls about this or there's a bit of swelling on the, on the patient's eye. Um, there's not much to do about it except to elevate the patient's head to help to try and improve drainage and to allow gravity to try and reduce um, um, the swelling. Um, it becomes a bit more worrying if the um, chemosis is severe enough to prevent the patient from closing their eyes um, because that means that the cornea is exposed and the cornea would easily dry out, which has an effect on um, leading to things like um, um, uh, infections. So if you're worried that the patient is unable to close their eyes because of chemosis, then you might need to um, contact ophthalmology to see if we can um, temporarily close the leads, maybe using sutures or, or any other means. Um, but apart from elevating the head, you want to put a lot of lubricants in the eye um, to, to ensure that the cornea is still re receiving a lot of lubrication in spite of the chemosis. And you could also attempt to tip the eyelids together to ensure that the cornea is um, closed. And also, if you um, see from that picture on, on the top, um, um, the top picture there, the the fact that the conjunctiva is swollen means that even when the eyelids close, the inferior part of the cornea is not going to get enough wetting because there is that bridge that the, the lid has to go over. So, which is why it's important that if a patient has chemosis, you have to put a lot of lubricants in the eye to prevent the cornea from drying out. The next condition that affects the um, conjunctiva commonly is subconjunctival hemorrhage, which uh, I think we're all familiar with, which is just bleeding um, in the conjunctival space. Um, it's usually more common in older individuals, um, patients who have um, uncontrolled blood pressure, but it becomes important in ICU um, due to maybe patients being on antiplatelets or anticoagulants, um, patients who, whose blood pressure is not well controlled, or if there's anything that um, increases intrathoracic pressure and um, vomiting, um, coughing, valsava maneuvers can predispose the patients to subconjunctival hemorrhage. If the patient is conscious, they may tell you that whole, they heard a popping sensation um, in, in, in their eye. Um, 
uh, but usually it is painless and it doesn't affect the patient's vision. Um, there are two pictures here. The first one shows very extensive subconjunctival hemorrhage, while the lower one just shows a mild conjunct um, subconjunctival hemorrhage. Um, one thing to be aware of, even though it's a benign condition, it's good to differentiate this if this is a, a problem coming from the brain. If it's a simple subconjunctival hemorrhage, you should be able to see the, the, the posterior limits of the bleed. That, that, what I mean is if a patient looks down or looks to the side, you should be able to see some white uh, um, part, parts of the eye. But if you're not able to see the posterior limits of the bleed, then you should be a bit more worried that this patient may have um, intracranial bleed, which is tracking down into, into the eye. So just to be aware of this and also checking if there's any um, risk factors that could have predisposed the patients to having this. And if that is absent, again, you need to check that it's just a simple subconjunctival hemorrhage. In terms of treatment, you just need to observe and uh, you don't need to do anything. But if it's very significant, that's causing significant ballooning of the conjunctiva, again, you can put lubricants just to ensure that the cornea is well lubricated. Um, in fact, it almost seems as if all that we do in IC is to make sure that the cornea is well protected with everything that we do. OK, next slide, please. OK, so now we come to talk about the cornea, which is the next um, most important um, part of the eye that is affected in ICU. And there are very various conditions that could occur, um, um, such as a cornea abrasion. And um, the cornea itself is made up of about five layers. And when you talk about an abrasion, it just means that the top layer, the epithelium, is missing from the cornea. And um, usually it should appear clean as the um, the the top picture here, it should act, the cornea should be clear and it shouldn't be any whitish deposits in it for you to say this is a corneal abrasion. If the patient is conscious, they will complain of significant discomfort, pain, and sometimes they might have redness of the eye because, like I said, the cornea is very, very densely innervated. Sometimes for patients who have dry eyes, um, they might say, oh, when they woke up and they opened their eyelids, that's when they, they noticed there was a lot of pain in their eye. This happens because the, if the, um, the cornea is very dry, the lids get stuck down to it. And once they try and open their eyes, it pulls off the top part of the cornea. And so the way to, to know that this is a corneal abrasion, like I said, is one, the cornea itself should be completely clear. And you might be able to see the extent of the abrasion when you look with the pen touch. And if there's access to a fluorescent dye, if you put that in and shine a blue light on it, you would see it clearly delineated as in the lower picture that we can see. Um, the treatment that we normally offer for this is chlorophenical ointment four times a day for five days. And usually within 24 hours, the patient should start to feel better or you shouldn't be able to notice that the abrasion is getting smaller or has even completely healed. If this doesn't happen, then you have to reassess again and see if it's really a corneal abrasion or if there's something else going on in the eye. OK. Next slide, please. Right, so exposure keratopathy. Um, like I said, this simply just means that the surface of the cornea is, is dry, and this could be due to a variety of reasons, but the most common is because the cornea is not receiving enough, um, um, or enough tears or the lids are not closing properly. And when that happens, it means that the cornea is just exposed to um, external air. And in patients who are, on, uh, who are having um, mechanical ventilation or have oxygen via face masks are particularly prone to developing this because of the artificial air that is being blown into, into their, their eyes. And if you see from the top picture there, that's just a picture of exposure keratopathy. When you put fluorescein dye and shiny blue light, you can just see uneven patches on the cornea. The patients sometimes may have red eyes as well. They might tell you that they've got a lot of um, gritty sensation in the eye. And those are for patients that are conscious, of course. If patient is unconscious, you should suspect it if their eyelids are not being closed pro properly for a prolonged period of time. Um, if it's left untreated for a long period of time, then you begin to get a picture like what's on the lower um, left part of this um, of this um, PowerPoint, where you can see a whitish band on the cornea. And it's usually on the inferior part because that's where the eyelid is not closing. And um, you might also see some blood vessels growing into this whitish um, um, part of the eye. And it's quite important that this is picked up quite early and dealt with appropriately because if it's if it isn't, then the patient could develop um, a bacterial infection of the cornea and even worse still, the cornea might perforate, that is, um, give way um, because of the dryness of the surface of the eye. 
Okay, so the way to deal with this is to um, prescribe lubricants um, for the patients. A preempt that it could happen in patients who are unconscious and put them on regular lubricants. And for patients who are um, conscious, but for whatever reason are unable to close their eyelids, we should also prescribe them with lubricants to prevent this from happening. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now we talk about um, a bacterial infection in, in the cornea, which could result from all sorts of things, um, bacteria, fungi, or um, even um, um, viral infections such as herpes. Um, the most common um, infection in the ICU environment, according to one study, was um, Pseudomonas. So Pseudomonas was the big um, uh, bug that they found in most patients who had microbial keratitis. And they found that it was especially common in patients who were ventilated uh, or patients who had um, 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 respiratory um, secretions. And um, like I said, it could either be bacterial, fungal, or, or viral. And the way to suspect that this is going on is when you look at the cornea and it looks hazy, or you can see a whitish patch, patch in, the, in the cornea, and the patient is complaining of pain, or the eye is very red and sensitive to light, then you know that there is, uh, there might be um, an infection going on. And the, the picture, the middle picture there um, shows a classic dendritic ulcer, which results from a, a viral infection, especially herpes. Um, it's not very common in the ICU, but it could occur. And you normally see it as um, something that appears like a tree branch in, in, in the cornea when you put a fluorescent um, dye in. And the lower picture shows a more severe bacterial infection where there's a bit of pus inside the eye called ipopion, and there's a, a lot more even in the center. It just all looks very whitish and, and cloudy. And so if you see the set of picture, you begin to suspect that this patient might have an infection. And the first thing you do before putting any chloramphenicol or anything is to just take a swab, um, um, just a, a cotton swab for MCS or, 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 or viral um, PCR and send it off before thinking of commencing chloramphenicol if you choose to do that. And also, these patients definitely have to be seen by um, the ophthalmologist for further management. So if you see this, please do not hesitate to call the ophthalmologist. Next slide. Okay, so red eye is also something that is quite common in um, the ICU, and it could be a red eye doesn't always mean that the patient has an infection. It could be simply due to the fact that the patient's eyes are dry, so ocular surface disease. It could be due to infection, or it could be due to inflammation, things like uveitis, or even in some rare cases, it might be that the patient's um, intraocular pressure is high, and so the, the eye is red. Um, the things to look out for is one check, does this patient have any sign of any ocular surface disease? Is there any crossing around the eyelids? Uh, is there any discharge from the eye? And if there is discharge, is it purulent? Is it watery? Um, these are the things that help you to sort of differentiate if it's an infection or an inflammation. And also looking at your cornea with your, your pen touch, does the cornea appear clear or does it appear cloudy, which would um, signify a more of an infective um, cause. So um, putting all of those signs together, if, if you're not confident that this looks like just a conjunctivitis or this looks like um, dry eyes, um, then you should contact the ophthalmologist. But we always say, please take a picture and put it on nerve center um, so we can have a look and see what it looks like. And then we can also follow the progress and see how things are progressing with the patient. Okay, next slide. OK, so um, how do we care for the eye in the ICU? First thing, we want to have a care plan for the eye. So every patient that comes in, we want to um, know exactly what we're, we're doing for them as regards their eye. And this will be determined by if the patient is conscious or unconscious. And after we've assessed the eye to see are the, are the patient able to close their eyes um, 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 normally, are they at risk of their eyes being exposed, probably due to them having had muscle relaxants or them being unconscious. Um, you want to also check um, um, are they having mechanical ventilation or are they having any oxygenation that could put them more at risk of having problems with the surface of their eye? And all of this should be assessed first once, once the patient comes in and again regularly throughout the admission because this will help you to um, 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 change the treatment plan if need be as you go along. Next slide, please. OK, so um, in the previous slide, I mentioned something called lag of thalamus, and lag of thalamus simply means that the patient is unable to close their eyes fully. And there is a grade, grade zero to two. 
the first grade is zero, where the patient is still able to close their eyes. You cannot see their conjunctiva, you cannot see their cornea. Grade one is when the patient is able to close their eyes, but you can still see a bit of the, uh, of the white part of the eye, the conjunctiva. And grade two is where you can see the conjunctiva and some part of the cornea. Um, no matter how little it is, once you can see the cornea, then this is um, classed as grade two. Okay, next slide, please. And, and this table just tells us, just summarizes um, some of the risk factors associated um, with ocular surface disease in, in ICU and the mechanism by which they, um, they occur. Um, like I mentioned earlier on, patients with reduced conscious level, they won't be able to close and um, blink their eyes um, adequately, and they might have some further from exposure from incomplete lead closure. Um, patients who are in the ICU environment are at increased, um, they have an increased exposure to microorganisms, so they might be at, at risk of developing microbial um, infections in the eye. And patients who already have pre-existing um, ocular surface problems, again, have an increased susceptibility to infection. So this just tells us um, the different risk factors and the mechanisms by which they cause problems in the eye. Okay, next slide. Okay, so how do we prevent this from happening in a patient who doesn't already have uh, problems with their eye? First, you want to lubricate the eyes regularly and you want to use ointments. Um, sometimes we can give eye drops if the patient is um, conscious, but really what we want is an ointment because this is more viscous and tends to stay on the eye um, longer than eye drops. And it should be used at least four times a day. Um, and based on the lack of thalamus grading, for patients with grade zero, and patients who are conscious, you don't need to put any lubricants in their eye because they can blink um, probably um, pro um, properly. For patients with grade one who have some of their conjunctiva exposed, you want to give them lubricants at least four times a day. And for those who have grade two um, um, exposure, you want to give them lubricants. And on top of that, you want to tape the eyelids um, when needed or especially when they are going to sleep. Next slide. Okay, so this um, slide just tells us a bit of how we're supposed to be um, applying the lubricants. So first thing you want to do, if the patient has already had some lubricants um, put on, you want to clean off um, any um, um, dried off ointment or any um, secretion from the eye before um, applying a fresh uh, uh, um, dose of ointment. And then you want to pull, sometimes people put the ointment on the eyelids. That's not where we want it. We want it inside the eye. So you just pull the lower eyelid down and um, squeeze uh, about one line or two lines of the ointment in the eye, and then just ask the patient to blink or just you um, use your hands to pull the eyelids together. I must also mention that one should be careful about when you're putting the um, drops of the lubricant or uh, the ointment in, because there sometimes people can inadvertently scratch the cornea and cause the patient a corneal abrasion or sometimes they touch the conjunctiva, that can also cause it to bleed. So this is something to be mindful of that. Even though you want to put the ointment inside the eye, you really don't want your tube to be touching any part of the patient's eye. Um, if you need to apply tape into the patient's eye, it's um, recommended that we use a Meripod tape. I know there's some um, pre-packed um, tapes that were available in the ICU when I was there, but these do not actually hold the eyelids the way we want it to. So we recommend um, using Meripore tape and we need to ensure that the patient's eyelashes are completely turned out of the eye because the last thing you want to do is to tape the eye with the eyelashes all inside the patient's eye, which will scratch the patient's um, cornea and we don't want that. So make sure that the, the eyelids are being turned out of the eye. If you need to use a, a, a cotton board to ensure this, then you can do that. And then you put the um, tape in an horizontal fashion rather than vertically. Um, if the patient has significant chemosis that prevents taping from stain, then you could call the ophthalmologist and we could come and suture the eyelids together if that's what needs to be done to protect the cornea. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going to mention quickly about endophthalmitis. Um, as I said earlier, it's an intraocular infection. Um, it's not very common in ICU, but it could happen, especially in patients who have um, um, fungal infections. So any patients who has tested positive on their blood culture 
or lines it for candida or any fungal infection, um, we should suspect that they could be at risk of having endogenous um, fungal endophthalmitis. Um, if the patient is conscious, you, you could ask them regularly if they're, to report to you if there's any change in their vision, if they're noticing any black dots, or if their vision is getting blurry. If the patient is unconscious, they cannot tell you, or if the patient is conscious and cannot tell you um, if there's anything wrong with their eye, then you should contact the ophthalmologist to come and do a dilated eye exam. Next slide, please. I just mentioned here briefly about neuro-ophthalmology, uh, things to be mindful of, like different pupillary size that wasn't noticed when the patient came on admission, um, bulging of the eye, of the eye, which is called proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, which means the patient cannot move their eye around. If you notice any of these things, the first thing to do is to um, do a, a neuroimaging to rule out any life-threatening pathology before we contact ophthalmology about what the next step will be. Next slide. Okay, so I've just summarized um, what the care plan of a patient who comes into ICU should be. Um, first, like I said, we need to assess the patient first thing when they come in and document exactly how we, what we want to be done. If they require just having lubricants, uh, say every four hours or every six hours, or if they require having lubricants and um, taping of the eyelid based on what you think their risk factors um, are, um, we should have that care plan in place even before um, we say anything else. And then for patients who have um, different conditions, uh, cornea abrasion, to put um, ointments in the eye and then reassess them in 24 hours. If it's not better, please contact us. For patients who have um, things that we, 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 if we think they have exposure, again, um, please put a picture on, on nerve center if there's any lack of thermos or anything um, or redness of the eye, and then review them regularly and on a daily basis. And if they're not improving with lubricants and taping to contact ophthalmology, in a patient who's unconscious or prone, they must have lubricants and they must have their eyes taped and they should be uh, um, assessed, the eyes should be assessed regularly on a daily basis. Um, for chemosis or uh, conjunct subconjunctival hemorrhage, um, elevate the, the head of the patient if they have chemosis and um, give them lubricants if it's severe enough to prevent proper eyelid um, closure. And for any patient who has a red eye, it's not always uh, an infection. It could be just due to dryness of the eye. But if you notice any significant discharge from the eye, please do take a swab um, from the eye. And if it's anything um, untoward, then you can contact ophthalmology with the result of this. Next slide. So in conclusion, it's always better to prevent a disease from happening rather than trying to cure it. So um, if we have a, 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 a care plan for each patient for their eyes, once they come into um, the ICU, it may help to prevent a lot of the um, ocular surface problems that we've talked about. Um, if you have any new eye problem, please put a picture on left center and update the pictures if there's any progression. And if we are not comfortable with anything, you can always contact the on-call ophthalmology doctor um, and we can come and see them and advise accordingly. Thank you. My reference is a next slide. Thank you. I'll take any questions that you may have now. Thank you, Dr. Moore. That was Any questions? I'm struggling to hear you. Thanks for that question. Um, so, like I said, it depends on what you think the risk of this um, patients are. So, even if they don't have pathology at admission, for instance, if a patient is unconscious, you know that you know they they won't be able to close their eyes properly. So, they should have lubricants um, prescribed as standard practice. For patients who have muscle relaxants, even if they are conscious, you know that the tone to the um, eyelid muscles will be reduced. So they wouldn't be able to, it might look like they're able to close their eyes during the day, but it's when they're sleeping at night that you would notice that, you know, they're not closing their eyes properly. So again, they should have um, lubricants as standard practice. So it just depends about on, on the risk factors that you think the patient has. If the patient is conscious um, and no or little risk factors, then you don't need to do that. But and then, like I said, regularly assessing them, um, you know, I think they always do a four hourly assessment. So if there's anything that has changed in the patient's situation that makes you think that, well, maybe they would now need lubricant, even though they didn't need it before, then um, yeah, you should prescribe it for them. But there are some patients that stand that you should 
just prescribe a standard practice. So such as unconscious patients, um, patients who are prone, um, patients who have facial edema, um, those patients should definitely have um, lubricants prescribed as standard practice. I think so. I think so as well, because sometimes this get missed and the patient, yes. the patient is just left without. And like you said, the, what we want to prescribe is the ointment rather than the eye drops, because those ones um, tend to stay uh, a bit longer. But something to be mindful of um, for patients who are, who are conscious and we're prescribing ointment for, um, you should please just warn them that their vision will be blurred because then they might panic that, well, I can't really see after you put this thing in my eye. But obviously, because it's quite a viscous substance, it blurs their vision. Yeah. I was just about to ask this. For patients who are not on medication or on drugs, I mean, there is a lot of drawing on the pressure of the medication. How would you show up that exposure to the medication? Okay, thanks for that question. Um, exposure keratitis is reversible from whatever cause it is. Um, but the thing is, instituting the right type of um, treatment, if you don't put enough lubricant, if the patient's eye is very dry, then you need to put, consider even putting in the treatment um, every hour if needed. Um, the only thing is, if you don't do that and the, the cornea continues to remain dry, then they're at risk of, you know, having a, a, an infection in the eye or the cornea could even perforate due to the dryness. So the, the, um, exposure is always reversible, but it's about instituting the right treatment at the right time that helps to prevent from any um, um, permanent damage to the, to the cornea. And yes, um, ointment in awake patients is tricky, um, but it's doable. Um, and like I said, you know, just warning them that it will um, blur their vision. And the trick is always to ask the patient to look up while you pull their lower lid down. And then you can just squirt in the ointment into the little pocket that you, you get. Thank you. Any other questions? If there are no questions, we can close the teaching session. Thank you. Our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a link uh, so that uh, you can get the, give the feedback and give the for attending this teaching. Thank you. It's in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Long. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Dr. All right. Bye, everyone.